joined here by Conservative MPP Deepak Anand from the riding of Mississauga Malton. We appreciate you being here and do have a number of questions to ask you as you are the representative of the Ontario government. Hello MPP Deepak Anand. Your government recently announced that Ontario will begin moving chronically ill hospital patients out of the hospitals and into long-term care homes without their consent to free up space for COVID-19 patients. How will this help to lower the burden on our health care system? Uh, first of all, thank you, Julia, for giving me the opportunity you know, um, to talk to the audience from TAC TV. And thank you for being part of my writing of Mississauga Malton. And I'm so blessed uh, that, you know, we have wonderful people in the writing of Mrs. Saga Malton, who is actually always thinking about the community out loud. Um, your question about the healthcare, uh, your question is uh, very valid, uh, especially because of we're going through this COVID-19. Um, you know, number of cases uh, this morning I was listening, it was about over 900 cases. And uh, I, I do remember when doctors used to talk about and they will say, oh, we want to make sure our uh, ICU cases are less than 150. So we are safe. We are fine. We can have those surgeries in place and we can take care of our resident. And now then the, the bar was went up to 500. And now we are looking at like between 800 and 900 every day. So if you really look at it, what we have to do is we have to think it this way. If somebody gets hurt, somebody is in, in a need is, um, of the ICU bed, uh, we, what do you do in that case? What the government is uh, uh, put together this order, wherein if if possible, again the word is if possible that uh, you know you can move somebody to the long term care so that they still get the required uh, service, they still get required care. So this way, by moving somebody to the long-term care, uh, you're creating a space in the ICU. Uh, God will, we don't have to go to that uh, zero uh, down, wherein you know there is a lockdown and there's there's no space in the ICU. Uh, but again, I think uh, we all need to understand that we're going through a tough time, and these are temporary arrangements to make sure uh, that we put the health and the well-being of our interiors at uh, at, at the forefront. Your government recently introduced legislation with the intention to put the brakes on stunt driving and streetcar racing on Ontario roads. Can you tell our viewers how you think this will help? Well, first of all, the name of the bill is called MOMS, M-O-M-S. And uh, the, the re we should look at why we initially thought of having this bill. For an example, uh, if you look at the data, the stunt driving had increased 130 percent between 2013 and 19. Uh, the roadside driver suspension for street racing uh, was an additional 52 percent between March and August of 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. So, so if you see it, it is definitely you see an uptrend in the uh, number of these uh, people who are driving at a speed which is unreasonable. And uh, I, I would say COVID has a part to play in it because you see the, you, you know, you're, you're driving on a road with less traffic and you tend to increase the accelerator, but you forget that it's somebody waiting for you at home. And not just somebody is waiting for you at home, God forbid you bumped into somebody and that person's without any, uh, th that's not their mistake and they have to, to go through the pain and their family has to go through the pain. So what it is doing in this through is uh, we try, we and it has a lot of components. It's not just adding, increasing the penalty or increasing the time for the impound. It actually adds a lot more education piece into it so that we need to educate our uh, kids and youth and everybody uh, about the stunt driving. Towing was always an issue. We, we've heard it many, many times from many, many residents. So part of that uh, bill is going to be looking after the towing, uh, how we can make the uh, towing industry uh, more responsible and accountable through this bill as well. I understand that you and the local city councillor have been working collaboratively with Peel Regional Police in trying to tackle local crime and have even been holding successful joint meetings. How important is it to you to maintain a working relationship with both city and Peel Regional Police? Well, at the end of the day, we all have a common goal, and including you guys who are actually uh, giving the information to the community. 
uh, that we want to have we want to raise our children uh, in a safe environment we want to have a good life we want to enjoy our life uh, so we want uh, as you know uh, canada is number one in terms of uh, raising uh, your family uh, so so if you look at this way so we want to make sure that you know anything that we can do and collaborate as elected officials with the police with the frontline workers uh, so that our community at large can live well so in that perspective uh, absolutely you're so right it is important to work together and that's what we're doing and covid actually has shown us uh, when you work together you collaborate together you can uh, you can get better results Premier Ford has once again called for tougher border measures as variants of concern ramp up. Do you think that the federal government has been helpful enough in that regard? Well, I, I think uh, the best answer I can give it to you is that we need to look at it, what we are asking and why are we asking. And Premier Ford has been advocating this since last year. I actually had been advocating this for a last from last year as well, and there is a, there is a reason and the rationale behind it is because I uh, am the member from Mississauga Malton, so Greater Toronto Airport is part of my riding, and it is our responsibility to make sure that the people who work at Greater Toronto Airport and many of them are actually from Malton, and many times when the people who land here, their first home is Malton, so 11% of any given point of time. When the new new Canadians come, they take Malton as their uh, uh, home. So it is very much important that we make sure that everyone who is coming, who is living, who is working, is a safe. And I can give you an example. We looked at the data la I, uh, last uh, month. Uh, there were over 76 uh, within a frame time frame of two weeks. There were 76 such flights were there where there was uh, cases, COVID cases. Uh, we've seen and we have identified there were COVID cases came from India, for an example, 32 flights. I actually, coincidentally, I actually got a call from a resident. His sister came day before yesterday and she was uh, COVID positive as well. So again, looking at this, it makes absolute sense that, you know, when we want to make sure that we contain this virus, we have to make sure that we make, uh, we put barriers everywhere possible so that the COVID does not enter into our community. And, and especially with this new VOCs, it uh, travels faster it, uh, and uh, it, it uh, is more contagious and it means we need to put more control in place. So absolutely, uh, I truly believe it is a necessity. Your question is, is uh, the federal government listening? I hope they are, and I am sure they will, and I am very positive. We'll, we've seen in the past, we've implemented the PCR testing at the airport, and I'm, I'm very confident uh, they will keep working with us to make sure that our uh, uh, Canadian at large are uh, safe and sound. Ontario has just introduced three paid sick days for workers and have offered to boost federal sick leave to $1,000. Why did it take this long for the Premier to take action? So I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, something which is really uh, amazing to see. I was actually in the Queen's Park today when uh, co putting workers first uh, uh, bill was uh, gone, passed through. It actually ramped through. Uh, we went through the second reading, third reading. And and I, I appreciate everybody again. And a great example when we came, when we come together, we work together, we can achieve more. Uh, so. Uh, in we we felt uh, fr right from the beginning that uh, there is definite need for uh, fixing the uh, CRSB program. Uh, minister has been talking about it. Premier had been, had talked about it. I actually put together a um, PowerPoint presentation. I introduced that to the whole caucus. And so, if you really look at the uh, CRSP program, which is again to help the workers, but there were gaps. The gaps was, for an example, there was a need for the increasing flexibility. Uh, rather than the employee, it should be the employer who should uh, apply. The reason for that being when employee is sick, um, you know, that employee does not, many times doesn't have the ability uh, and the strength to apply for it. Uh, the second issue was that uh, it was uh, short of the minimum wages even so it was a it was not an income replacement it was more like a income uh, support and uh, many times when uh, some somebody is going pay to pay paycheck to paycheck uh, the, it may be very difficult for them to um, 
to see this that uh, if they don't go to the work that means they are not going to be having enough money to run that uh, their home on that day uh, accessibility was a bigger issue in terms of say an example if you uh, in order for you to qualify you have to have 50% or more of your work uh, you should be working and sometimes there are new canadians sometimes there's uh, international students for an example who just landed 6 7 4 months back and they don't meet the eligibility criteria of 5001 once we have seen that one thing is very common with this uh, virus is that it does not discriminate it you know yes, yes. it doesn't it doesn't pick you or me or anyone you know so it is very important if somebody uh, and especially those who are on a paycheck to paycheck it is extremely important that they should have 100% flexibility they don't even have to think twice uh, what should i do in this case they, so i truly believe this is a right step and i truly believe uh, by doing what we did today we made sure uh, you know if even if you're going for a vaccine even if you are having symptom if you're taking test uh, you don't have to think second uh, i would urge everybody please make sure if you are not feeling well uh, stay home stay safe take care of your family and take care of a community at large and thanks to the government of ontario thanks to our uh, government uh, federal government also there is enough resources available now with this today uh, you can actually uh, on on a cumulated basis you are eligible for total of 23 days of uh, paid uh, leave sick leaves you can take and uh, if you add up the whole amount it is up to $4600 that you can get uh, through this program uh, combined now, um, with your last comment about how many days total that you can take off for sick days, I've been seeing uh, once we heard about the three day sick leave announced, um, I was seeing a lot of backlash on social media saying that, OK, we have to quarantine for 14 days and we only get three days paid sick leave. So uh, do you have any anything to say about that or anything to say about how like this is ending on September 25th? I know that you're mentioning that there's quite a few more days that you can take uh, leave off of. So, yeah, absolutely, uh, Julia. So what happens is, say an example, if somebody is having a symptom or somebody is going for a vaccine or somebody is not feeling well or they're, uh, they are positive and uh, they can apply for the first piece, which is uh, uh, three days, which will be paid by the provincial government. So this is how it's going to work. Your employer is going to apply and uh, you will get paid as as usual. Your employer is going to apply to WSIB. Even if they don't have an account with WSIB, they don't need to have an account with WSIB. Uh, they can open up a temporary account with WSIB. So they apply, they get the money uh, to their account. You already got paid as per by the employer. And then you can also apply for the CRSB. And under the CRSB, as you know, at, as it stands right now, uh, you basically are eligible to get uh, $500 per week for four weeks. So that's how uh, when you add up total at this point of time, yes, you're right. Uh, uh, you can get three full up to $200 per day uh, from the provincial government and followed by uh, up to four weeks, $500 per week from the federal government. Uh, and that's what we are requesting the the federal government. The, there's an ongoing conversation going on between the ministry and the federal government about uh, enhancing and uh, what we have suggested to them, making sure that increasing the flexibility, increasing the support and reducing the the uh, constraint or the increasing the accessibility. So hopefully we will have that coming up soon as well. And uh, when you put these whole things together and with the top up up from the provincial government of $500 on top of 500. So in total, you will see there is going to be a possibility that the resident can get up to 23 days up to $4,600. In regard to vaccination, Ontario is putting half of all COVID-19 vaccine shipments into designated hot zones, and anyone 18 plus will be eligible to book shots by the end of May, thanks to major supply increases by Pfizer, provincial officials say. I understand that the provincial system currently is allowing anyone in Ontario to book into a clinic for a vaccine within a 100 kilometer radius of their home postal code. 
This has resulted in Toronto residents booking vaccines in Peel and Peel residents being able to book as far away as Simcoe County. Do you think that this is a fair way to conduct vaccine bookings? So, Julia, let's let's be uh, again. We're looking at the numbers and we're looking at uh, thanks to again uh, vaccine availability now, which we have, and uh, when we look at the eligibility criteria, I mean, looking at this way, uh, when you are in the hot zones, uh, you are eligible to apply. And and I'll give you an example, something which happened recently last week, uh, because when they when you're applying for the vaccine, uh, some of the folks who uh, applied and uh, they they went to the vaccine clinic and the the issue was uh, sometimes what happens is that when you're adding your date of birth, you tend, uh, in their, one of their cases was that they actually entered the wrong data by mistake, six became nine, nine became six and the age changed because of that. But when they went to the clinic, uh, so they was not vaccinated, they was turned back. Uh, in those cases, I always tell them that, you know, uh, whenever there's such thing happen, make sure the data is correct. Make sure that you only go when you're eligible to go. Uh, again, I would say uh, thanks uh, that we're getting enough vaccine now. Uh, the eligibility is being broadened to the extent that uh, from May 3rd, Anyone who's 18 plus in the hot zones will be eligible to get the vaccine. So, again, I understand there was a initial kinks when we were not having initial uh, enough vaccine. There was many problems. Now we are very confident with the, so much of vaccine coming on, on board, uh, you will see more and more people getting vaccinated. Thank you so much for your time with us today, MPP Anand. And lastly, is there any message that you would like to deliver to your riding area residents as well as Ontarians? Julia, the only thing I want to say is I see that more and more people as the, when we initially started with the COVID-19, uh, we were hoping it's going to be, you know, somebody predicted is going to be two months, somebody predicted it's going to be three, six months, somebody predicted maybe nine months. But we know it's already over 14 I mean, we started in January, so it's like over 14, 15 months. And you can literally mm -hmm. see the fatigue. You can see that, you know, uh, we are all we all got affected from day one. But that that effect is being more visible today than it was last year, of course, because it was not that much of pain and pressure we've gone through. So the only thing I want to say is that, you know, um, yes, uh, we are all of us are going through a lot of pain and pressure, a lot of stress, a lot of mental uh, stresses. Uh, but we have seen it. We have seen that when we worked together last uh, along this period of time, we were able to achieve more. So uh, I would just urge everybody uh, with more vaccine coming, more vaccine going into the arms. We are hoping to get over 70% done. Uh, in Peel region in the hot zones by the end of the May and we are, we are hoping uh, more vaccine coming and everybody getting vaccinated, more restrictions being pulled off and more uh, life coming back to a new normal. So uh, my only message would be we've done so much, so disciplined, so sac many sacrifices. Just give it a little bit more time and let's uh, cons be considerate to each other. Um, I know it is difficult. I know it is hard. I'm, um, I, I'm myself is feeling the pinch and the pain and the stress and the, um, and I would only say, uh, you know, l let's keep working together and let's uh, beat this COVID-19. We've shown it that uh, humanity is more bigger, important than the COVID-19. So let's not fail. Let's win it the battle again. And we are in this together. So that's all I would say. Um, please, please uh, be more patient, be more considerate. Uh, we are all getting tired, but let's be more uh, patient to each other, be more considerate to each other. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Julia. Best, uh, stay safe and hopefully, um, we'll all be uh, out of this and we'll be back with new normals. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching News Talk with Julia Cosby on Take TV.